Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gethin Nadin, uh, Director of Employee Wellbeing at Benefex. Um, thanks for coming. We appreciate there's lots of train stuff on today, and so if you're staying later, we, uh, we appreciate that. So, so to get straight into it, um, we wanted to first talk about, you know, there's the whole session today, everything's about well-being. There's you know, almost 100 providers out there talking about well-being. Um, but actually, if you start to look at some of the most recent research that's come out in the last two months, some really big research that's come out of the US, if you build well-being, people probably won't come to it. Pardon the name, I'm sure they get this all the time, <laughs> but this, uh, this organization, BJ's Wholesale in the US, so a very recent study that came out in April 2019 looked at how well-being initiatives were delivered in that organization to 33,000 US employees and how actually that changed their health behavior and the results of that. And they studied all of these employees across a period of a year and a half. And what they found was the well-being program that they shined everyone up to made absolutely no difference at all to the well-being of their staff. There was no reduction in healthcare costs. They, the measures of things like stress and blood pressure and weight didn't change. People who went to the gym were as likely to go to the gym after um, the sessions ended than before. So actually, it made absolutely no difference. And this piece of research has got a huge amount of attention in the US and is starting to spur on some more research to look at actually our workplace wellbeing initiatives uh, achieving what we want them to. Uh, similarly, a couple of months ago, the University of Chicago published a really big study. They looked at 12,500 employees and to look at whether if they assigned them randomly to the wellbeing program, how they compared to people who weren't assigned to the wellbeing program whatsoever. And they found exactly the same results. And the only big result that came out of this study was that if you were a smoker, you were far less likely to get involved in workplace wellbeing than if you weren't. And if you went to the gym regularly, you were far more likely to be involved in the workplace well-being. And this mirrors probably about 10 big studies that have come out in just the last year alone that found that if you are interested in your well-being, you are significantly more likely to take part in workplace well-being than if you're not. So actually, what we started to see is people were only really interested in workplace well-being if they're already engaged in well-being. And I think part of the problem why most of these well-being solutions don't seem to work is that they aren't designed for humans that are living in the modern world. All of the providers that are out there at the moment, all the people that are out there selling well-being in the UK, all the providers that are outside at the moment, this is just as many as I could find. And actually what that starts to, to leave our clients and lots of HR people I speak to and well-being experts is, how do I cut through that noise? If I'm going to make a decision about delivering a well-being strategy, what am I supposed to do with that? Am I going to go and meet 150 providers and critically assess which one of those is going to be best for my organization and my people? And then am I going to keep on top of all the new technologies and well-being and fintech providers that are coming into the market every few months, especially in London? You have 1,000 new fintechs looking at financial well-being uh, appeared in the last two years in London alone. So what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to cut through all that noise? So that's causing a big, big problem uh, for HR and award. Um, and I'm part of the founding members of the Engaged Success Thought Action Group. So a non-profit society, Engaged Success, you've probably all heard of. We've started to look now at how can we actually help employers with their well-being. And as part of that Thought Action Group, we surveyed all the people who attended the Mad World Conference to ask them what help they needed to deliver workplace well-being. And these are the responses we got. Appreciate you can't see that, but the detail is not important. But what that graph shows you is there's no one obvious piece of help that people need. So actually, as a group, we're really confused. So we're working with Engaged Success and the CIPD to find out, well, if that's the confusion that exists, along with all the providers out in the market, are we just at a place where we risk the apathy of HR and wellbeing experts who are just kind of saying, I don't know where to start. This is really too confusing. There's too much choice. And that's driving huge amounts of frustration. So we see reward and benefits over here, and now we've added well-being. And if we're doing that through technology, we're adding it to the stacks we've already got in the workplace. So all of a sudden, you end up with loads of different places for employees to go. And actually, what we can start to see if you look at how you interact with things like technology in your uh, consumer lives, if it's too difficult, you just don't do it. <coughs> so how do we start to motivate those people who are unmotivated, as the research shows, people who aren't really interested in their health and well-being, and actually, how do we help employers cut through some of the noise that's currently in the market? 
So there's a couple of things we need to understand in psychology as to why people aren't fully engaged in specifically improving their well-being. The first one is that people don't act rationally. So we all know we need to eat less sugar. We all know we need to eat less fat. We all know we need to exercise more. But we still don't do it. And there's um, a phenomenon in psychology which looks at, specifically when you're looking at health and well-being, it is much harder for us to change behaviours because it's easier for us to just stand here and do nothing than it is for us to go for a run. And it's easier for us to press a button on a lift than it is for us to walk up the stairs. And so changing that behaviour is a much, much bigger task than we think it is. And there's also something called uh, utility theory. And if you get a chance after this, we won't go into the detail of it, but if you look up utility theory, it's based on the idea that we try to maximise pleasure in our lives and we try to minimise pain. So we always go towards more pleasure and, and little pain. And obviously when you think about exercise, the pleasure comes far after the pain usually if you've been for a, a few miles run. So again, it's really difficult for us to balance that out. And, and as I mentioned earlier on, we are in a situation where we know what's good for us, but because we don't act rationally and because of the way utility theory controls our thinking, it's actually quite a big effort for us to change well-being behaviour. Uh, and we know from the research as well that health, health behaviour is driven far less by conscious processes. So we aren't actively thinking about the things we need to do. And if any of you have read uh, the book Thinking Fast and Slow, that tells you a lot about how we just do lots of things instinctively without thinking about them. And the moment we have to start thinking about them, the far less likely we are to do because it just becomes a little bit more difficult. What we also see a lot of in well-being is uh, choice architecture, which is also uh, very similar studies also look at Hicks law and the paradox of choice. Giving people more choice is not a good thing. So there's been research that have looked at if you have 20 jam jars on, for sale in Tesco's on the shelf, people are far less likely to buy jam than if you had five options in front of them. And marketeers use this quite a lot. But again, if you think back to that slide with all those logos, if we're giving people loads of different options to help their well-being, are we giving them too many options? Are we actually, you know, there's that paradox of if we give them more choice, that's a good thing. But actually, if we narrowed that choice down, could we get better results? We also don't give feedback. So we're used to kind of things like wearables giving us this kind of immediate feedback, and that works really, really well. But when we look at how we give feedback to how well somebody's doing when they're looking at their own well-being, we need to focus on the fact that if you give somebody positive feedback, that reinforces the end goal that they're heading for. If you give them negative feedback, then it completely changes the way that they, they act. So negative feedback encourages people to work harder. Positive feedback reinforces the end goal. So there are two things, especially when we're trying to get people to move more and take better care of their mental health and to sleep more. There are two things that we need to keep in mind. And there's also something in psychology called the cocktail party effect. So this is the idea that when you're sitting in a busy room at co or in a cocktail party, you're able to look at somebody and you can narrow in on their voice and what they're saying. And we have the ability to block out the rest of the noise. And actually what we start to see is people are pretty good at doing that um, when looking at text and videos, etc. And you've probably seen this with the, uh, the gorilla video where people are playing basketball and the gorilla walks through the middle. If you haven't seen it, look it up on YouTube. It's been used a lot in business. But when we focus on something, we see it a lot more than when we don't focus on it. So giving people all this choice means they have to try quite hard to focus on it. And they can do that, but actually what we want to try to do is remove some of that, that choice and give people more of a point uh, of focus. And so when we look at real behavior change, we need to be looking at forming habits. So there's a really good example of how people form habits. Um, you've probably all heard of Febreze. Anyone use Febreze? It's nobody? Okay, I use, <laughs> I use Febreze. You've all got clean houses. Yeah. Um, um, so if you look at someone like Febreze, when Febreze created, when Procter & Gramble created that product, they thought they'd created a really good household product. Um, and the way it was marketed, and you probably saw some of the adverts that came out originally, was if you have a stinky home, if you've got pets, if you've got a teenage son with you know, dirty socks around his bedroom, if you go and spray this Febreze around, it will make it better, it will make it smell nicer, and you've kind of solved that problem. And they thought they'd kind of hit gold with it, and they sat back and waited for the sales to come in. And when Febreze was still la initially launched, the sales plummeted. They just didn't, they didn't start to sell the product in the way that they expected to. And the reason is, is they didn't have a real trigger for somebody to buy their product. Because what they started to find is that when they went to speak to people who lived in smelly houses, and the researchers said they visited this one woman's house, and she had about five cats. And they asked her, how do you cover the smell of the cats? And her response was, well, I'm quite lucky that my cats don't smell. 
And all the researchers were like, your cats definitely smell and we can smell <laughs> it. Um, and anyone who's got dogs, you kind of see this all the time. You see it with smokers as well. They become immune to the smell in their house. So actually what Febreze realized is they didn't have a trigger point. People wouldn't buy their product because they didn't think they had smelly homes. So they tried to then remarket Febreze as a way of becoming part of your cleaning routine. And then that's launched the success of the product that we know that none of you buy, but I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that's what they started to do, is they needed to look at the fact that there needed to be a motivation, there needed to be a trigger, um, but there also needed to be an ongoing reward, which obviously, as we know, lots about kind of instant gratification and rewards. But one of the things we're missing in wellbeing is that trigger. We don't have a really compelling reason for somebody to start improving their health. Lots of providers look at um, reactionary stuff. So if you're immediately in a sense of danger related to your mental health or your financial well-being, you can go and consolidate your debts or you can phone your employee assistance program and speak to a counsellor. But very little look at preventative measures. And it's really hard for us to create a trigger when there's not a problem. So that's something we really need to think about. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I haven't just been stood here like <laughs> just cheering you on there separately. We haven't actually done anything on stage ever before, have we together? We haven't, no. It's, uh, I was, it's almost a bit like a double act, but I felt like saying if, if people laugh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So um, Gethy has obviously kind of gone through the theory. When we look at products ever, we always tend to start with lots and lots of research, talk lots and lots to customers, try and understand like where, where's the market at, what, pe what are people struggling with and those types of things. Um, I don't want you to all feel like I've just thrown the words artificial intelligence into a slide because it's like cool and now, right? So I think I've got a personal theory that from my perspective, the branch of AI machine learning will, will kind of disappear into products and it will just inherently be there in everything that we use. And you're starting to see that more and more in that people are talking less and less about artificial intelligences and trying not to scare people. And they're embed but they are embedding more and more and more of the technology into products. And I think it's going to have a fundamental impact on well-being. Because as Gethin said, what we're trying to do is take an apathetic, largely apathetic group of people and trying to help make kind of consistent, lasting behavior change. But to do that, we have to kind of think about meeting them kind of where they are at the moment. And there's no doubt at all that everyone, certainly everyone I talk to, is kind of in overload. Whether that's kind of in work, at home, the two things combined together, it's just stuff coming at us all the time, OK? There's no doubt about it at all. Like, I mean, how many of you in this room have a phone, a smartphone? Yeah, OK, cool. How many of you use your smartphone to wake you up? How many of you reckon that the time between you waking up and looking at your screen itself is less than 60 seconds? Scary, right? So when you think you're connected to all this information, we as professionals who are trying to get positive messages to people about their well-being, about how to help manage things like mental well-being, or maybe a challenge that somebody's going through, we also have to cut through that noise to try and get those positive messages to people. And if I put that into a bit more context, the average company we work with has 29 different systems at work. As Gethin has showed you, you know, kind of half of those today are in HR, but as Gethin has showed you, you could, by rolling out well-being, like really compound this issue, you could end up with another five or 10 or more from there. And the interesting thing about that is actually what we're trying to have to do is constantly compete with all the other messages that are going to someone, right? All these devices that have been created, your little flashing notification icon, you know, these guys are even having to build stuff into their products to stop us killing ourselves, which is always a little bit unique as a positioning. Um, but I think what's fascinating for me is that I wanted to kind of just play a quick 60 seconds of video that to me summarizes what we as professionals have to try and cut through. And then I'll come back to kind of why I think it's important and how I think technology can actually help that. This commercial is just one minute out of the 10 hours a day you spent glued to your screens. That's 152 days a year. That's 32 years of your life. Scrolling stuff, clicking stuff, emojiing stuff, watching other people's pictures of their cafe macchiato or their dog or their baby or their dog and baby or the view out of their airplane window or a rainbow. Watching bloggers take something out of a box. Watching reality shows. Watching shows about housewives. Watching shows about housewives in a different state. Watching dragons. Watching a year's worth of one show about a Colombian businessman in one evening watching someone else playing a video game watching cats being cats swiping left 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 shake right left right deciding if a picture is a labradoodle or fried chicken deciding if a picture is a chihuahua or a muffin or a puppy or a bagel reading comments from someone you barely know posting about something you don't care about telling 647 people what's on your mind reading what's on the mind of 647 people reading a tremendous amount of opinions about politics 
So, I, I mean, contextually, obviously, it's, it's a video from Nike about running. But I, I think for me, it's really kind of just trying to set the scene of that notification environment is kind of where we all live every single day, right? Whether it's work calling us, something outside of work calling us, something we love calling us, something we hate calling us, these kind of notifications come at us all the time. And as professionals, we've got to think about like how we get there for these messages out to people and in the context. And what we found from the research is actually at the point I try and engage or I try and engage with somebody, when I do that, it has to be super relevant and it has to really resonate with me. Because if you don't manage that, in those early days, it will just I just literally won't engage with it at all. I'll, par I'll park it in a box of that's not relevant to me for whatever reason, and I don't come back to it. And we see this time and time and time again. And I think it's really interesting. You know, a couple of years ago, we started to talk about an audience of one and how the market was generally moving there. So kind of away from bucketing people into groups, away from personas, and much, much more towards thinking about people as individuals and how they might want to be communicated to. And I think it's really, really relevant when it comes to well-being because we all engage with it in different ways. You know, I look at organizations that do kind of global challenges and there's a group of people that really get excited about that and involved, but it's not the majority in most of the organizations that we talk to and that we're involved with. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So I think we've got to start to think about how we get people to information. How do we kind of really cleverly and smartly funnel people to the information that they need access to? You can use this machine learning piece, so effectively machines to start to put content that's relevant to you. Because some of the really exciting things you can do is if you start to get to this place where you can drive relevance, the machines can help you drive more and more and more relevance. It can start to build better profiles of people to enable actually a guided journey to start to happen. Because it can understand that Gethin has looked at this content before. Gethin might be here in his journey with us about thinking about financial wellness. Maybe Gethin's reached out about, I'm not picking on you here specifically, um, but maybe Gethin's reached out about a few different things. And you can can start to profile that, and the technology can start to actually drive uh, slightly different behavior and drive information to people. One of the things we've got to bear in mind is the more we do that, the more nudges we put in front of people, potentially the more we drive the addiction, potentially the more we drive screen time. So we have to all be kind of a little bit aware of we might be trying to counter uh, some of the things that we're driving ourselves. But the really interesting thing for me about machine learning is as a branch of artificial intelligence, what it's designed to do is take huge volumes of information and really try and start to make sense of it, to really start to try and drive relevant and contextual information to you. And you see it all the time day to day. Hands up if you've used Amazon in the last week or so. Amazon has huge algorithms running over all of it about what to recommend, what to put in front of you, what to offer you, what discounts to give you. you know, Prime is an absolute classic. Anyone got Prime? We all sound like the same people. Um, but Prime for me is really fascinating because the second we did that, the recommendation suddenly became not just about me because my kids all used it. So now it's like subtly hinting that like I need to buy them a present. So it kind of like puts like my little pony stuff in front of me or whatever it might do. But the thing is that's really interesting is it enables you to start to better understand an individual, probably better than you're ever going to get from the other data that you hold because it will start to take that data, other people's data, and it will take the core of what that person's starting to engage with and interact with and enable you to target target them with better information. If you kind of look at kind of left to right on this slide, how we've historically always done things is we organize stuff into sites and libraries and hierarchies, right? You go navigate a normal website, you find a menu, you go through it. We then move to kind of search, right? And search is kind of much more organic. But if anyone, only of you use Google, you know you have to be really quite, it's brilliant, but you have to be very specific. And if you ask it a question, well, it probably won't give you too much of a good answer. It might take a guess. So the really interesting thing, though, about thinking about artificial intelligence and thinking about how that kind of manifests in the kind of format of kind of bots and those types of things is actually it enables you to get people to really relevant content where they are. So if I'm on a page looking at you know, something to do with my own well-being, or I'm very, very deep within a kind of set of information and content, you can really start to target people with very, very specific and curated information at that point. So when you think about the content, and when we started to think about it kind of with customers and kind of part of what Gethin was talking about solving some of those challenges, there's some really interesting bits within that. There's tons and tons of data about the fact that these kind of bots that are here and able to provide relevant and contextual information to people um, you know, really, really do help learning and engagement. They remove judgment. The bot doesn't care if you've watched it once or 100 times, to be brutally frank. It's there. You can use it. You can talk to it whenever you want to. And they really organize information in a really kind of contextually relevant way. So we're kind of thinking about it in this context of like decision assistance. When I'm making up my mind about something, to be involved with it, to get engaged with it, to decide whether I want to kind of be part of it, it's really about bringing together all sets of information and starting to enable you to actually look at how can I get someone simply and quickly to that information. Today, it's very much about guided journeys. So where are you at? What are you looking at? How can we give you the relevant information in front of you and help you get out to other content? 
But we're going to end up in a place where it's very much moves to open questions, either by voice or otherwise. But you're starting to move to this environment where, actually, you can start to help people in a really relevant and contextual way. If I make that real, this is Doug. Doug's just unfortunately been diagnosed with cancer. I'm sure we've all had relatives in a similar situation. Luckily, Doug has an organization that cares about him and provides lots and lots of different benefits that he can get access to. The challenge for Doug is the second he starts on a journey with one of those benefits, like the healthcare plan, he doesn't know that all the other things exist. Exist. And very rarely do all of those connect together and talk about it. But what you can start to do is use this to put other information in front of Doug that might be useful and helpful that he didn't know about. And so actually you start to simplify my world, enable me to feel like you really know me as a whole person, and suggest and put relevant information in front. And it's just one of lots and lots of ways, apologies for the Simpsons reference there, but there's lots and lots of ways that I think kind of, you know, we will start to see this technology come through and start to really simplify the information we put in front of people, but also build a really specific profile for them as part of that. The last thing I'll say is I think what it enables us to do as well is to reach people how they want to engage as well. And please don't ignore that. If I want to use my phone to engage with you, if I want to use my watch, my machine, a phone, whatever it might be, you have to meet people where they want to be. One of the biggest ways you lose people is context switching. If I've called you and you push me to a chat, I'm going to just probably switch off. You, know, you have something like an 82% dropout rate if you switch the method by which I've contacted you. Okay? There's a lot we've gone through there. We're happy to do kind of any demos or any of those kind of things before. But what we're trying to show was from the research about wanting to do stuff that's really about changing behavior and changing mindsets right through then to how do you really make it relevant, make it resonate, and really connect with people in a way that makes them want to come back to it and that they pay attention to it. Because at the end of the day, I think what we're trying to do here all of us is trying to get to a place where people can really help themselves to be kind of a complete person and to be as well as they possibly can be. Uh, we're out there on a stand. Come find us. Gethin and I are also very visible online, on LinkedIn. On Gethin is way more visible than I am. But um, uh, if you kind of, we love people who heckle as well. If you completely disagree with us, we'd love that challenge too because um, it's a point of learning for us. We spent a load of time trying to work out what to do in this space, but really what we're trying to do is simplify this mess of lots and lots of other providers and make it easy for you and employees to get involved and engage with all of this underlying great stuff that you're already doing and anything new you might do off the back of that. Anything you want to add? No, nope. that'd be great. If you can let us know we did all right as a double act. I felt a bit weird stood over here. I thought I was going to fall off the stage at one point because I was like watching you and then I kind of thought I was maybe going to disappear. I did that once earlier in the year and it wasn't very funny because it was caught on camera. Uh, please don't go try and find it. Um, uh, thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll catch up with you later. Cheers.